Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. This is Thursday, February 4th, and this is our coronavirus update. Uh, this is the third one we've done this week. We had a, a special uh, announcement yesterday because we wanted to cover some of the vaccination issues. Under normal circumstances, we're reporting on Mondays and Thursdays to give you an idea of where we stand with the virus, and today is our normal Thursday update. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next week, we plan to do Monday and Thursday as normal, unless there's a reason to come back before you. We're trying to be, uh, you know, considerate of your time, uh, but also at the same time try to try to be as transparent as we can with the information that we have as we receive it. So uh, yesterday, I did not uh, dwell very much on the coronavirus infection outbreaks because much of our dialogue has been about vaccinations. We'll talk about vaccinations in a second, but let me get you up to speed on the infection outbreak. The tracker for today from New York State. Uh, has uh, come up with today's numbers, and it shows a continued diminution in the number of active cases. This is a good sign, the first time we've seen some good signs probably in the last two and a half months. We started uh, to see an increase in the number of infections on or about late October, and it got particularly uh, high after the Thanksgiving holiday and then the Christmas holiday and then New Year's Eve. All three of those were spikes that pushed us even higher than the normal increase. And there was a point in time around Election Day, not that long ago, when we were around 1,500, 1,600 active cases in the county. We had peaked out at 11,600 active cases uh, within the last month. So today's numbers, we have 9,343 active cases of coronavirus. That's on a basis in total from the beginning of the pandemic, 95,989 people that have contracted COVID over the course of this pandemic, and 86,646 of them have gone through the two-week period of incubation, uh, so that the total that's active today, 9,343. We went under the 10,000 mark, actually, yesterday's numbers on Wednesday, and that was the first time we've been under, under 10,000 since uh, the beginning of January. To give you comparisons, a week ago today, we were at 11,200. Uh, two weeks ago, we were 11,400, almost 11,500. We were 11,200 the week before that, uh, and we were at the 10,000 mark on January 7th, which is, in essence, a month ago. So our 9,000 mark puts us uh, very close to where we were right about at the end of the first week uh, of the new year. Now, keep in mind, you generally see movement after an event in about a 10-day to two-week period after the event. So you don't, uh, you don't have the virus incubate in you the very day that you're infected. It goes two, three, four days, sometimes as much as a week. So we didn't see the spike on uh, Christmas and then on New Year's until 10th to the 15th of January. That's when the numbers started to spike up very high. But right now, they've come down the last two days under 10,000, 9,343 active cases. We had 349 people tested positive yesterday. And uh, we've tested overall 1,814,761 tests for COVID. There are a million people in Westchester County, so you can see now that we have multiple tests going on for people who live in Westchester County. I've said before, I've been personally tested twice, and many people have been tested many more times than that. There was a point in time at which we were tracking that number of testing based on the population, but now we know that uh, testing once, twice, three, more than times, and that depends on what incidents may happen in your life, whether you've been exposed to it potentially or not. And um, But we've had a grand total of 95,989 people that have at some point in time tested positive for COVID. And that's an important number because I just want to jump over to vaccinations to give you a comparison. Uh, our vaccination number through uh, yesterday's results, Wednesday, February 3rd, there are two areas where the county has direct involvement in vaccinations. That is not the only places in Westchester County for which vaccines are being disseminated. We'll talk about that in a second. But the two that the county government is involved in is the county-run health clinic in White Plains on Court Street. There we have vaccinated in totality 5,054 individuals. The county center we vaccinated, and this is a state-run um, center, but it's on county property, and the county, along with Westchester Medical Center, are partners in that vaccination process. And there, where we're doing, uh, on a good day, over 1,000 people a day, 22,393 people vaccinated. The grand total that the county is directly involved is 27,447 vaccinations. Now, that number compared against a million Westchester residents, you know, is, is really not an impressive number. What I think is important is as that number rises, we're looking for a comparable drop 
in the number of infections. The theory, of course, of vaccination is if I'm vaccinated, I am now less likely or extremely unlikely to get the disease. And so the, the value of the vaccination given is shown in the reduction in the amount of infection. So at some point in time, we're looking for the number of people vaccinated to exceed the number of people that have ever gotten the disease. That number is 95,900. Now, ultimately, we want to get to a million people in Westchester County. And we've talked before, and it still remains a significant problem, that the production of the vaccine uh, and the, the federal government uh, obtaining that vaccine for distribution is still well below the level of volume that we need in order to vaccinate everybody. So it's not the mechanism of having enough physical places to set up vaccination centers that we can do, uh, the number of people to give out vaccines that we can do. It's having amount of doses product to give out. But again, 27,000 just within our two units. Now, if you go on to our uh, Westchester Gov website, westchestergov.com, and you have an icon to click on for coronavirus information, you'll see that we are listing uh, this week's uh, distribution of vaccine from New York State that goes to uh, all of the different entities. Now, they'll mention some of the chain uh, pharmacies. They'll be identified by a number, the number of the branch of the store of that chain whether it's CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, whatever it is, uh, you can very easily go on, uh, Google up that number, and it'll show you where the location of it is in Westchester County. And so the number of, of entities like that. You'll also see some entities that represent Westchester County Department of Health and uh, some of the hospitals that are also given vaccine. Uh, we, are, we are going to update the website. It's not updated right now, but we're going to update it, and we're going to identify that the Westchester County Center, because it is a state-run facility, it's one of the, the mega centers around the state, We'll qualify how that, that listing is not part of what you're reading, but we'll state it in a, in a note. And then also the pop-up centers that have been created, which is, again, state-structured, small doses allowed for a particular locations. not a pharmacy, it's not a hospital, but it's a location for a temporary vaccination center. I saw one of those today in Mount Vernon at Grace Baptist Church on South 6th Avenue. Uh, there's also, and they will be operating today. Tomorrow, they're going to serve about 510 people from within that uh, community in, in uh, the city of Mount Vernon. There is another uh, center that's in No Dine Hill, the community center in Yonkers. That's opening. That's open today, open tomorrow. Uh, and then there'll be one in Peekskill at the Kiley uh, Center tomorrow. Now, none of these centers except walk-in individuals do not, let's be clear, do not walk into these centers or any of those pharmacies or any of the county facilities and say, I'd like to get a vaccine and shot. That is not how it is working. There are certain cohorts of individuals that have been uh, deemed eligible by the state of New York. They established this, and it's all across the state, not just in Westchester County. They establish who is eligible to get a shot, and you have to go into the system and have an appointment before you come to any of these facilities where vaccines are being given out. But it's important to understand to, to see where we are overall. The two locations that Westchester County is involved in directly, 27,000 approaching 30,000 by the end of today, uh, we could come very close to the 30,000 mark. And that number, while it's nowhere near the 1 million population, if it starts to exceed the number of people that have gotten the disease, we're starting to get to a critical baseline of people that are protected from getting the disease going forward. And we think that's an important step on the way toward hopefully what will be full vaccination uh, of the county and, of course, full vaccination of society. Uh, the numbers on hospitalization uh, are, are still in the five range of 500. It's stayed that way for the last few weeks. The most recent number that we have is 521 people hospitalized for COVID as of Tuesday, which is just two days ago, February 2nd. That number, 521, a week ago Tuesday was 569. So that's a net drop of 40 individuals. Two weeks ago, that number was 588 people hospitalized, so that's a net drop in 67 people hospitalized, and it was at 554 the week before that. We have been in the range of 500 or so people now for about three, almost four weeks, and the number at 521, while it's not a low number, is has stopped this uh, uh, tremendous rocket-like explosion that we had during the Thanksgiving, Christmas, into New Year's peak. So that is a good sign. Uh, we're not out of the pandemic. We look for signs to give you a sense of trend, but trend does not ultimately mean that we are out of the woods, but that you understand that we are encouraged by the hospitalization numbers 
in the sense that they're not as high as we thought they might be. Right now, we're averaging about 5% of all the active cases are hospitalized. That's a very small percent. Back in the spring, if you go back and look at when we had a somewhat similar level of active cases, we were running 18 19% of those people hospitalized. So to have 5% of them hospitalized is good news. The hope is, is that the lesser amount that you have hospitalized, the, the more that people, while they get COVID, are not as severely sick, and therefore they don't have to be hospitalized, and that many of these folks who are in hospitalizations they're in now, they'll leave hospitalization, they'll, they'll regain enough health to go home. Others who contract the disease will go into the hospitals, but hopefully uh, that, that that number, that net number, continues to go down, and we'll look for that as a trend line. Obviously, with fatalities, uh, the number of people that die is simply an accumulative number. Whoever we lose adds to the total number. As of today, we've lost 1,948 individuals. The fatality number is not a comforting number. Um, we've seen ourselves jump quite a bit since uh, December in the number of people that we've lost. We lost 11 people last night. We lost 11 people the night before that. 10 the night before that, 11 the night before that, and that, that small level double digit number has been going on for over a week every night. So the general sense is, is that most of the people who get the disease are recovering from it. Most of them do not become hospitalized because of it. A lesser amount are hospitalized because of it. But for those people for whom this disease attacks in a severe way, we're, we are losing more people now than we did at any period of time since we had the peak last year. And again, uh, this disease affects lots of different demographics. Uh, it affects people of color to a greater extent, but the single biggest demographic is age. When you are over the age of 60, over the age of 70, uh, the percentage of people that we lose are very, very high in those age categories. People of all age categories have died from this disease, and uh, people in their 40s, people in their 50s, but it's not a high percentage of the total people. It is age that is a major factor, and of course, people of a certain age, I'm in that age category, uh, you have to be particularly careful about your comings and your goings, your masking, your sanitizing your hands, uh, looking at a situation saying, I ought not to go there, there's too many people too close together, and knowing the people does not get you off the hook. Just because it's a group of family members or a group of longtime friends, I have the same exact emotion uh, here in the county office building. There's a person I went to high school with, I've been a friend with for a long, long time, just retired from county government. My first reaction seemed was to give him a hug because I hadn't seen him in a long time and I'm very happy for him and you gotta catch yourself. Uh, amongst friends of long standing, you can still convey COVID. So it's important for you to understand. I have to understand, I have to remind myself and, and I don't act as if I do it perfectly and you ought to be like me. I make the same mistakes everybody else does. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten out of my car or left the office building here and I start my journey out and I catch myself, I didn't bring my mask with me. I have to go back and get the mask and put it on. So if it happens to you, it happens to me, it happens to all of us, but it's part of what we have to do to continue to fight this disease. I'm tired of wearing a mask. I hear from Dr. Fauci, I ought to wear two masks now, but whatever it is to get through this, that's what we have to do. I have to remember to do it, you have to remember to do it, uh, and, and we all uh, run the risk of getting the disease, and we all run the risk of fatality, so we all have to be diligent in doing this. To complete the numbers then, we have good numbers in the drop of active cases. We have uh, encouraging stability in the amount of hospitalizations. Uh, the death uh, total, unfortunately, continues to rise, and we continue to grieve for all of those people we've lost. Uh, we are approaching, <clears throat> in a couple of weeks, about a month from now, uh, the one-year anniversary of when the first case was identified, and we intend to have recognition of that uh, moment uh, with a sober um, activity, one that recognizes the people that have suffered from COVID and those that we've lost from COVID. And that is an important part of our society. As much as we have lost high school graduations, I lost my 50th reunion from high school, but fell within this period of time. People that had planned weddings have to change wedding dates. That's very disconcerting to brides and grooms who've been waiting for this event. Uh, we've lost the ability to enjoy sports. We've lost the ability to go out and eat easily with each other and all those different things. We've lost a lot of those social connections uh, in all of this, but the, the mission is to get through this and that we will have those social connections on the other side of the, of the mountain. However long this takes, it's taking longer than we ever thought it would, but you know, uh, we may be finished with the virus, the virus is not finished with us, and now that we have the vaccines, we look to that as an important step forward. So uh, those are the numbers as we have it. We had a glitch uh, overnight last night uh, on our dashboard, Westchester County dashboard. 
Uh, when anything goes wrong, we hear about it in Technicolor. A lot of people commented on Facebook. Uh, we got calls from uh, any number of different individuals who pointed out. Uh, it took us some time this morning to fix the glitch that was wrong, but the dashboard is now fixed. So when you go on the dashboard, you will see the information that breaks down the number of cases, active cases, uh, both currently and the total cases year to date. As I've often said, additional statistical information has not been released to us by the state, so we can't share that because we don't have it. We are putting vaccination numbers on the dashboard so you'll be able to see the accumulation of vaccinations, and those are the ones that we directly are involved with because we don't get a report from all of the other vaccine locations. That report, guess it, goes to the state, and the state makes the decisions on how to deal with that. Um, if you have any issues with the dashboard, reach out to us. It's, our, it's the universal email that I give you here uh, for questions from the press and uh, when we have our town hall meetings. Communications, plural, communications at westchestergov.com. That'll come into Catherine Chaffee in our communications department. And at uh, 2 in the morning, if you're looking at the dashboard and you see something wrong with it, send an email. We'll see it. Uh, I think Catherine gets up much earlier than first thing in the morning, and, and she'll start working on it right away. And remember, when you're on the dashboard, just about two months ago, there was no dashboard. There was three times, five times a week, a map that was mailed out. So we've ramped up the communications and brought it into the 21st century with the dashboard. And we will improve it. We'll try to maintain it. But keep in mind, whenever you get frustrated by things, we have made efforts to improve our communications to you. And that is one recognition of it. Now, we are going to be expanding our vaccination efforts to include a vaccine location at the Westchester Community College. On Grasslands Road, it's, it's uh, Valhalla as a post office. Uh, it falls in the town of Mount Pleasant, right adjacent to the town of Greenberg. Uh, if you're familiar with it, it's a large campus and it'll be identified uh, exactly where we are on campus. This will be our second county run location. And uh, it's important because we need uh, some additional space in order to help people. We are now facing giving out second shots to those people who at our county clinic four, three and four weeks ago received their first shot. And so now we have to have additional space because in addition to, to giving people first shots, additional new people first shots, we need to go back and revisit the original cohort, the original 5,000 people, and make sure those people come through and get their second shot. So that's going to give us more work to do. So now we're going to have two locations to be able to deal with it, one in uh, on the Mount Pleasant Greenberg uh, borderline, and then one here in downtown uh, White Plains, Mount Pleasant Greenberg and downtown White Plains. And that is separate and distinct from the county center, which continues to do its work. Now, there are people who have complained about the lines at the county center. Those lines began on Wednesday and Thursday. Let me back up. There were lines on Sunday. The lines on Sunday were from people who did not have appointments and they were afraid that they were going to lose appointments, so they just thought they'd come. I re said it once before. I said it two times yesterday. Let me repeat it again. Do not under any circumstances, just go to a vaccination site, you will be rejected. There are, no, there are no vaccines to be had at the end of the day that we're going to throw out, and you can sneak in and get one. No. We make sure that we give a vaccine to every single person, and we plan on that situation at the end of the day. We do not want to have these lines. The lines were created uh, yesterday, today perhaps as well, maybe tomorrow, because we lost Monday and Tuesday with appointments for people for vaccinations. We lost those two days because of the snow. Uh, round numbers, a thousand appointments a day. We wanted to make sure that those people got in and got their vaccination within the week that they had scheduled it because they were targeted and planning for it. Nobody planned on the snowstorm. So we've had to take Wednesday, Thursday, and I assume Friday's existing appointments and layer on top of that another 1,000 people. There is no way you can do that without running into lines. So this is not structural lines. We had run the place for two weeks with just smooth operation, and it will be smooth operation again. But we felt the urgency to make sure that Monday and Tuesday appointments were honored within the week. And to the greater extent, that will be the case. There will certainly be individuals that could not come back in yesterday, today, or tomorrow. And those people, we will catch up as we go along. But we're anticipating that we'll go back to the way we operated from Saturday on if we've completed it. Remember, we're open seven days a week at that location. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. But when you see the lines, it is not for any managerial reason. We are trying to make sure that everybody who's entitled to get a shot, who's registered to get a shot, has an appointment to get a shot, gets the shot within a tight time frame. This may happen again. 
we have no uh, no guarantee that it won't snow again and that that snow won't knock us out for another day or two again in the future. What we ask you to do is be reasonable and understand what the circumstances are. That's the reason for the lines at the county center and to some extent the lines that we had at the uh, clinic. At the clinic, we anticipated the snowstorm. We controlled the flow at the clinic. We anticipated the snowstorm, so to the credit of uh, Dr. Amler, Renee Recchia and their team and our executive team here, Joan McDonald and Emily Saltzman, uh, they, they decided not to take Monday appointments and so our challenge here was a lot less. We had Tuesday appointments that we had to backfill, but not two days' worth of appointments. And they're here the numbers are smaller in the three to 400 range. So that was able to, um, uh, to work through. We're also working now with all of the different uh, occupational cohorts that have been authorized by the state. In the original 1A category, EMS individuals were authorized, health individuals, people who are working in the healthcare field, doctors, nurses, therapists and technicians and so forth. And then 1B category, when that opened up, that gave us the rest of the uh, first responders, community, the police and the fire, and then also opened up with teachers, people in the educational field, and then a host of other different uh, working areas and components. Uh, funeral directors, uh, we had uh, bus drivers, uh, individuals uh, that fit into some of those other categories. They are all still eligible. The state establishes the eligibility rules. You have to be 65 and older or in one of these targeted working cohorts. You can come from any place in New York State and sign up and get an appointment to have your shot at the county center. It is not limited to Westchester residents. The target is anybody who lives in New York or anybody who works in New York, which means you might live in Connecticut or New Jersey, perhaps further out than that. Why is that the case? Because if you are a worker in a critical role, if you live in Stamford, Connecticut, but you drive a bus that goes from Port Chester to White Plains, you are subject to the disease and you're subject to passing the disease because you work in New York and you give that disease to other New Yorkers who you're interacting with. So you work in New York or you live in New York, you're entitled for the vaccines as they are structured through the state. And if you're from Putnam County or Dutchess County and you call and you get an appointment at the county center, we give you that vaccine in the same way that people from Westchester have gone into New York City, gone to Javits, gone to Aqueduct, and also gotten a, um, a vaccine. Uh, but again, these rules are pretty strict, and I've heard everybody tell me 15 reasons why they should get it. And in some cases, I'm sympathetic because somebody makes a case. They talk about their medical history. Their medical history is problematic. I can understand that, but I can't override the rules that have been established by the state. The governor has established which cohort when, and as uh, they determine how to expand it, they expand it. And as soon as we expand it, we will then start to try to organize ourselves to accommodate that expanded community. To that extent, on Tuesday, this being Thursday, the governor announced on Tuesday in the midday hour that there were three additional categories that were being allowed for vaccination. People who drive taxis and limousines, and also by extension, those in transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, restaurant workers, rather large group of people, and also uh, those who work at developmentally uh, facilities for the developmentally disabled that are sponsored by the state. We immediately reached out through our resources here, through Sherry Rosen Asher, to the various chambers of commerce in Westchester County. We keep an active relationship with them. That is a new outreach of county government has been very helpful. We've been able to provide resources through the chambers to local businesses <clears throat> that need financial assistance during this pandemic. But that relationship now comes into play where we can survey the chambers of commerce for their members that are restaurants, and they can identify how many people need to be vaccinated. So we start to have information to then uh, get those people through and, uh, and uh, vaccined. We're also working through Natasha Caputo, who heads our film office, also reaches out to certain uh, hospitality industry cohorts to the Restaurant Association do the same thing. However, we still have so many available vaccines in any given day. Because we added categories of people did not mean they gave us more product to give to those people. So the funnel is no larger than it was before, but more information, more people come into the top of the funnel. Let me give you a very practical minded example. There's a dish and there's 10 cookies on the dish. Right now, there are 15 people eligible in the room to grab a cookie. There's not enough cookies for all 15 people. There's only 10 cookies on the plate. We've just authorized another seven people to be eligible to grab a cookie. We now have 22 people that are eligible to have a cookie. There's still only 10 cookies on the plate. 
Hopefully that gives you a visual to understand what happens when a, when a target group is added, but vaccine doses aren't added. We don't have additional cookies to give out. But it is appropriate for you, if you fit in any of these categories, to go on the, on the website for New York State and seek to get a, a, um, a vaccine appointment, and you are now eligible to get a vaccine appointment. What we're doing as a county is we're trying to identify uh, through uh, these industry segments so that we can work with the industry segments. We've been doing that with police. We've been doing that with fire. We've been doing it with EMS. We've been doing it with teachers. And in every one of these cases, we're working through some combination of the uh, unions that they're members of or the management of the different organizations that, uh, that run their function, school boards and uh, and uh, police and fire departments to try to make sure that the, that we can channel as many through as we have available vaccines for because they are eligible. And now we've reached out through the Chambers of Commerce and the restaurant associations to identify restaurant workers through their place of business. And we've also reached out through Leandra Ustache, who heads our Taxi and Limousine Commission, and she's communicating with taxi and limousine companies. And we're also having separate dialogue with the TNCs, the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world, to uh, identify those individuals, to get numbers so we know what we're dealing with. If we get more product, we will be able to uh, uh, inoculate uh, those individuals, uh, as well as the existing individuals who are entitled to get the inoculation. It is a difficult management. You won't be satisfied until there are more cookies on the plate and until you get the cookie that you want to have. And this is not meant to be a, a, a funny analogy. I try to make it that you can understand it. The vaccine protects you from a disease that could kill you. I understand that. I understand that. And I understand the stress that people have. I understand the stress that people have who have illnesses because I have friends of mine, I have some people who work here who have certain illnesses, and they're worried about it. They've gone through cancer treatment. They have lung issues, breathing issues, not yet to the level of COPD, but it concerns them. People who are diabetic or pre-diabetic, people have hypertension. All of these things make them very nervous about what happens if they get the COVID uh, virus. I understand that, and that is, a, that is a key priority. When the state opens the door and says people with those illnesses are now eligible to be vaccinated if they're under the age of 65, we will make sure that they have that opportunity right away. Wouldn't delay a bit. But I will tell you, I have not yet gotten my COVID vaccine. I actually had a pneumonia shot about uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and I'm not supposed to take a COVID shot until the pneumonia shot, which is a one, one-shot deal, is through my system. But I've hesitated to do it because... Um, I feel very healthy, and I know that there are people who are 65 or older who are not. And with so limited numbers of cookies on the plate, my sense is that people should get the cookies who need the cookies the most, and, and I will take it in due time. I also say that because many people constantly want to criticize those of us in public office and accuse us of being favoritism for ourselves or our cronies, and it's just sort of such an automatic thing, and everybody sort of agrees to it without knowing what the circumstances are. I am no less... Uh, afraid of getting COVID than anybody else is, given my age and you know other factors. But we have to prioritize the people that need it most. So I would ask you, if you're eligible for the COVID virus, then by all means sign up to get the vaccine. If you're eligible for the vaccine, by all means sign up for the vaccine. But keep in mind, we've got a limited amount of vaccine, and there are people that may need it more than you. And this may be one of those moments in which you open the door for somebody else to get through rather than you just walking through the door yourself. And I'm certainly, you know, concerned because with a limited amount of vaccine and a, and a great number of people out there that need the vaccine, we really would not want to make sure that we get the best possible result. And that is what some of the pop-up centers are targeted to do, to go into certain parts of the county and get a certain number of people vaccinated that would need it. Uh, when I was at Grace Baptist Church today, I saw a woman getting a vaccine 101 years old. And she was moving very slowly, but she was moving. And she was going there to get a vaccine to, uh, to protect her and to try to extend her life. And, you know, you can't help but be moved by that. Most of us don't reach that age. She has, and, uh, you know, she is there to try to save herself. And, you know, by God, she deserves that vaccine more than I do. And I'm glad that she got it today, the first step of a two-step process. Let me mention uh, uh, two other issues uh, that are related to this, not related directly to vaccines. One of them is uh, school sports. Uh, I think it's two weeks ago, uh, this week, uh, the governor announced that he was uh, allowing for, quote, unquote, high-risk school, high school sports to be able to uh, occur. Uh, he had prohibited that for an extended period of time. We are now in February, which is about at the end of the 
winter season of sports, which usually brings you basketball, hockey. Um, we, we lost the fall season of sports, which is usually um, uh, football as, as the marquee sport. And, and high-risk sports, basketball, hockey, football are three of them. There's others, wrestling, a few other ones. Low-risk sports, golf, swimming, uh, track and field, have always been allowed. But uh, the governor lifted his restriction on those sports two weeks ago, and he put the burden and the responsibility for making the decision on the county departments of health. So our uh, Commissioner of Health, Dr. Shalita Amler, who has been you know, our right hand in helping us get through this, uh, went through the process, uh, prepared some guidelines for implementation. They went out this week. Uh, it made people think that we were stopping high school sports. We were not stopping high school sports. Some people said that on Facebook. Some people said that even in an email, and they were wrong. We're not stopping sports. What we are doing is trying to make sure that you go through certain steps to ensure that you can play those sports safely. And it does require certain additional efforts. If, if one of the young athletes has had COVID-19, then they need a new physical. If they've had a physical uh, within the state parameters, 12 to 18 months, I made this point yesterday, uh, and they're healthy and they did not get COVID, then there's no reason to get another physical. All of this stuff was outlined. And we did a revised um, a note uh, earlier today uh, to the school districts. But for those parents who have lobbied us once the decision was taken from the state and given down to the county, and they said, you've got to let us play, you've got to let us play. First of all, remember, we got this decision about 10 days ago, and, and we have to do some due diligence. The governor and the state has had this opportunity now going back to August and determined that it was not healthy to open it up, and then they decided that it was, and now we have the responsibility to do it. We've worked with the other counties in Section 1, and we've moved forward, and those sports will continue. However, keep in mind, if we see an outbreak, a given team, as well as an athlete, but a given team and or a given sport might find itself closing down. You may remember that Major League Baseball opened up with certain protocols. The Miami Marlins, at one point the St. Louis Cardinals, had to stop what they were doing and, and missed certain games because the whole team was in a position of quarantine. Uh, you may recall that there was an NFL game scheduled for Sunday that had to be postponed until the middle of the week. I believe the Raven, Baltimore Ravens were involved. These were things that were done, even though things were scheduled, because the outbreak became significant. And we reserve the right to make those decisions if an outbreak occurs. If no outbreak occurs and everybody does everything possible, an individual athlete who is affected or exposed to it will, will go through the process of isolation, but the sport itself will not shut down. We will not shut the sport down. We understand how important it is. I played a little bit of high school sports myself. My daughter played some high school sports. I understand how important it is to the individual. But again, as I said yesterday, there's so many different things that are important to us. To go to a grave site and grieve um, or to wake or shiver call and grieve a loved one is an important thing to us. It's important to gather around the Thanksgiving table. It's fun to have an ethnic parade uh, for something that's important to you. But fun at the expense of health is, is, not, a, is not a reasonable trade-off. And so we're, we're going forward in high school sports. We hope we can do it well. We think we can do it well. We wouldn't authorize it if we didn't think we could manage it. And for those people out there on the other side of the issue, you shouldn't allow this, you shouldn't do this. The same, same things were said when we did Bicycle Sunday. The same things were said <clears throat> when we opened pools and beaches. Oh, my God, you're going to have blood on your hands. Actually, somebody said that to me. We manage those things well. They, we, we went through the season. There was no additional spread because of those sports. Now we're in a little bit different area. You know, when you get to high school wrestling, that's a little different than uh, Bicycle Sunday. But we're going to try to get through these things effectively and hopefully do it well. That is one issue that has been given to us. An issue that has not been given to us is opening the schools. There's a lot of folks who see the desirability of opening schools for full uh, education in, in the building. Um, and again, I can understand. I've seen my daughter go through elementary school, junior high school, or middle school and high school. I vaguely remember all those years ago when I went through those things. I, I grant that it's very difficult if you have multiple children uh, to, to, to learn remotely. Uh, at those tender ages, I think you need to be in a classroom setting with greater structure. I know even when I myself work at home, I'm easily distracted by something that happens in my world, something that happens on the phone. All of these things are understandable. And the desire to open the schools uh, is, is a reasonable desire. However, the decision uh, from the governor's standpoint has certain parameters to it and has left those decisions to the local school districts. And then it is left to the county health departments 
to make sure that whatever happens at those schools, that proper protocol is being, is being pursued in the way we sanitize, the way we socially distance, the way we handle all these things. Some school districts have in-room in learning. Some districts are totally closed. Many districts have this hybrid remote situation. The power to make those decisions, however, does not rest in county government. We are meant to be an assistant to help the schools in doing whatever it is they choose to do. Now, this is a difficult decision, and I don't blithely say, well, it's up to superintendents. Oh, it's up to the school boards. Every community is different. And in, and in communities, you have people who want the exact opposite things pulling on each other. One says shut it all down. One says open it all up. And, you know, I've spent time in public office. I've seen exactly what happens when you get to a controversial issue. That's why they're controversial. Because you have two points of view, and they're very strongly held, and they war with each other. And each side is absolutely convinced that they're right and absolutely convinced that the other side is absolutely wrong. And you have to try to make decisions in the public sector. In the private domain, you know, we make decisions differently. You argue uh, with a sibling over something. You argue with a spouse over something. You argue with a parent over something. It's, it's not done in the public domain. Here in the public domain, 35 parents want this, 32 parents want this, and, and the battle goes on. But understand, the county government does not make this decision. It is not our decision to make. If the governor were to devolve that to us, then we would take on that responsibility. We have shirked no responsibility when it is ours. In running this government, we have certain things that we are tasked with doing, and we do them, and we do them straightforwardly. The snowfall comes. We know what we have to clean. We know what we have to police. We know where we have to provide assistance. We know that we were tasked in the beginning of the pandemic with providing PPE. We know that we were tasked with having nurses go out and test people, and we're prepared to do that. And if these decisions are to be given to us, we'll take care of it. We'll deal with it. But right now, it's not in the bailiwick of the county government. So it's very important. As strongly as you feel about something, you need to know where you have to interact in order to accomplish what you want. In the opening of the closing of schools, there is some subjective uh, reality of it that involves what the county health department does, but the firm final decision belongs with the school district and with the state of New York. And we will work with a school district, whatever their choice is. If school district wants to open under certain parameters, we will work with them to help that happen. If the school district determines that it's in their interest to stay closed, that's the determination. The role that the teachers play in all of this is a very strong role. And we recognize that the ability to open schools are probably in direct proportion to how many teachers and how many workers in a school can get a vaccine. So they can feel safe going back into school setting. Why teachers? Well, because teachers are older. Many teachers fall into an age category or a health category where they feel vulnerable. The kids less likely to get COVID directly. The parents care about the kids. The teachers care about their own health, which is not an illogical place to be. So we will try to the extent that we can within the 10 cookies on the plate metaphor to uh, see how many of our teachers we can also help. At the same time, we're helping firefighters and now taxi and limousine drivers and funeral directors and whatever else is put into the cohort. At the end of the day, if we have enough vaccine at the top of the pyramid, all of these things disappear. If someone said tomorrow, we are gonna give you enough vaccines for every man, woman, child in Westchester County, within 30 days, everybody would be vaccinated. I have no doubt about that. But the production structure doesn't exist like that right now in the nation. Um, I, I think that this administration, the Biden administration, is doing what they can to get caught up in the 10 days, two weeks that they've been in office, but they have a long way to catch up. And there are things that coulda, shoulda, woulda, but weren't done, and now here's where we are, and we can't worry about what wasn't done. We gotta do what we can do and go forward from here. Uh, with that, uh, my final admonition, uh, I, I don't intend to be a nanny and say these things, but I have to mention it. Uh, this is Super Bowl Sunday. This is uh, another one of those great secular celebrations. I am a football fan. I think the Chiefs are going to win, but that's my opinion. Um, but regardless of who I think is going to win, this is one of those moments where everything else stops. There's no community events when Super Bowl Sunday comes. And because uh, more often than not, we're in private home settings, this looks a lot like Thanksgiving. This looks a lot like New Year's Eve, where you're with your friends in your home and you're relaxed and you're munching and you're watching the game. And if it's a good game, you're following it all the way through the end, 9 o'clock at night, whenever the game is going to be over. You can get COVID at a Super Bowl party just like you could get COVID at the Thanksgiving table. It's not just going out to a public event. You can get it in your own home if you have your friends over and somebody's been exposed to COVID. They may not even know they were, and then they can expose everybody at the party. You don't want to think about that. Probably it doesn't happen. You don't know. 
So keep that in mind. As you have your Super Bowl parties, take protections. Do what you know you need to do. You know, maybe you don't do it and maybe you get away with it, but what's the risk? The risk is you get COVID. The risk is you could get very sick from COVID. Talked to a friend of mine, um, uh, very recently just came through a battle of COVID, big guy, bigger than me, you know, fit guy. It's, it hit him for a loop. It, he's okay, he survived. Uh, it wasn't near death, but he was in bad shape. And he said that to me, and he said, this thing is a monster. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, uh, what could take him out? Well, COVID could. So it could happen to you, it could happen at your Super Bowl party. So just be smart, do what's prudent, so I'm going to say I'm not going to see you again until after the Super Bowl. And if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers win, then you can go on Facebook and say, well, you can't predict games. And how could you bet against Brady? You can say all that stuff. But the bottom line is whoever wins the game, be safe. Get through the Super Bowl and uh, avoid being one of these statistics that I talk about uh, each, uh, each time I give this report. We have some questions from the press. Catherine, please fire them away. Yes, the first question is from Jonathan Gordon from News 12 Westchester. He's asking if you can expand on the decision to have vaccines uh, for restaurant workers and taxi drivers and the disabled. Uh, Jonathan Gordon delivers this question from News 12. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, With these new categories, we recognize that we have to try to organize the information in some cohesive way. And so, as I think I said a little bit earlier on, let me repeat it again, we have reached out through Chambers of Commerce and the Restaurant Association, and we've also reached out uh, through the Taxi and Limousine Commission, which certifies taxi and limousine companies, and we've had outreach to some of the TNC organizations, Uber and Lyft, to ask each of them to identify the relevant organizations that fit into this category. So in other words, your Chamber of Commerce put together for us in the community that you're in, a list of the restaurants, a contact name, phone number, email for one person at that restaurant that we can interact with, and do a head count of how many people you have on you, in your workforce that wants a, a vaccine. Not everybody wants a vaccine. You could have 30 employees and 22 of them are willing to take a vaccine. You get that information to us, organized through the Chambers of Commerce, organized through the Restaurant Association. We now have the raw data. When we know we have availability of doses, we're in a position to call through the Chamber of Commerce to the business and say, okay, you got 22 folks, organize them, get them over here this Friday, we'll get everybody a shot. You've got 15 uh, taxi drivers or limo drivers for your organization, uh, come by on Friday, we can get everybody a shot. That's the way we can handle it. Now, you, the individual, if you're a restaurant worker, if you're a limousine driver, if you are uh, a person who works at a developmentally disabled facility, you don't have to wait for us to do this. You can get online and get a shot on your own. If you have a friend who can get you a shot some other place that's legitimate, by all means, do it. Don't wait for, for what we're trying to do. But from a standpoint, Jonathan, of organizing this, we want to go through by, by area of employment. Because remember, we're, we're vaccinating these people because they work in a specific industry at a specific job. And because they're doing that, then we'll try to organize collecting the data by that job and, and have it uh, you know, come to us. And for those people who might say, well, not all the restaurants are members of the Chambers of Commerce, that's correct. We hope that all restaurants are part of the Restaurant Association. And if they are part of the Restaurant Association, then that effort will catch those that fall outside of the Chamber of Commerce. If we have 10 cookies on the plate and we identify that the universe of people are 25 different people and there's another 25 beyond that, at least we have the first 25 names that are eligible to take a cookie off the plate. And then the additional 25 we'll try to, uh, uh, we will try to identify. So Jonathan, that's how we're approaching. We're trying to organize to get information. And we're doing that, by the way, these are the categories that have opened up. We're doing this for areas that haven't opened up. And I'll give you one example. We've tasked each of the different local governments to ask them to develop a list of homebound individuals in their community. If you live in Poundridge, if you live in Buchanan, if you live in Pelham Manor, if you live in the city of Yonkers, if you live in uh, Ossining Village or Ossining Town outside, wherever you live, we've asked the local governments to develop a list of people who we know, you know are homebound, cannot leave their house, and are eligible for the vaccine. Why? Because at some point in time, we hope to get authority from the state and an allocation of doses to send out mobile units to vaccinate. And when we send a mobile unit out, we don't know where to go, who's homebound. From a county standpoint, people don't register with the county in that capacity. So we'll then turn to Teresa Knickerbocker, uh, Marcus Serrano, who's the manager of Buchanan, and say, Madam Mayor, 
Uh, we're going to have a crew that can go into Buchanan. How many people do you have? She'll say, I've got a list with X number of people. We'll know how many doses to deliver. And then we can go in and take care of the homebound of Buchanan, take care of the homebound of Pound Ridge. And of course, Yonkers being the size that it is, it is a massive task. But we will work with Mayor Spano and his people, uh, Kelly Chiarella, who heads the senior, uh, who heads certain programs, uh, Jose Alvarado, to make sure that we do that. That is how we're dealing with a cohort that has not yet been identified by the state. So we're trying to look in advance, not just react to what happens now. And we may find that the governor determines that he announces tomorrow in his uh, Friday report that another cohort of people have been opened up to, uh, to the vaccine. We will then try to do the same thing. We'll try to figure out how do we organize it to reach those people, Jonathan. Next question. Next question is also from Jonathan. He would like to know if um, the testing site at WCC will be a building or a pop-up tent. Uh, the expectation will be indoors in a physical location. Uh, I do not know the physical location here as it's being worked out. Uh, if we know the circumstances, we'll certainly uh, share that uh, with members of the press. Now, um, it is very difficult to go in and look at a vaccination center. We have federal HIPAA laws. That's an acronym uh, that protects an individual's uh, privacy whenever they're going through a medical circumstance. So it is possible to get certain external shots and some internal shots to look in general about the way that some places are operated. But uh, for the sake of seeing what it looks like when individuals are, are receiving the vaccination, that requires releases by all those people. It's a very complicated process, particularly if we're dealing in a room with hundreds of people. Uh, but in terms of where the location is and where, uh, you know, what its hours of operation will be, we will share that as soon as we can. We expect it will be open six days a week. That's what we've done at the clinic here in White Plains. Uh, the county center is on a different level of magnitude, so they're open seven days a week. And uh, as soon as that is online, we'll let you know so that that second center is, is up and operative. Thank Jonathan Gordon from News 12 for those questions. He, he has one more. Has he, he has another one. Uh, he would like to know how people can sign up to specifically get the vaccine at WCC. It's the same. It's the same process as always. There is no separate process for WCC. You go into uh, the website uh, that the state has established. I, we probably have it here. We'll pull it up in a second. And you sign up for uh, a vaccine. You'll get your different options based on the available doses and then uh, if it's uh, WCC, then you go to the WCC site. If it's one of the other sites, you go to the other site. Same basic process as we operate. We are trying to work through, as I said before, groups that have been uh, authorized, uh, such as police, such as fire. And uh, when we try to organize those folks, we look for how much capacity we have, and then we block off a certain number of appointments so that we can make sure we vaccinate those individuals because we know we want our full police, fire, EMS, teachers to be vaccinated in order for us to function as a society. Uh, we're never, never going to open schools if you have 12 percent of the teachers vaccinated. That's not going to work. So we have to make extra effort to do that, and we try to organize that. But for you, the individual, if you want to get an individual appointment, you go to the website. That's the way to do it. Okay. The next question and the, the last question for us today is from Samantha Crawford from News 12. She asks, parents are holding a rally in White Plains this afternoon demanding that all Westchester schools open for a five-day in-person option now. They say their children deserve to be back in school full-time. The question is, who would make that decision, and do you think it's safe to open schools full-time as new, more contagious, more contagious variants are in our area? Question came from Samantha Crawford from News 12. <clears throat> um, I think it's possible to open schools, but I think each school district has different physical logistics. I've been in and out of innumerable school buildings in the county, and uh, when you open up this particular elementary school, it depends on the physical size, the number of kids who go there, uh, the flow of people through it. If, uh, just as an example, if you have a short, long building, um, you can move people through without them being in stairwells going from one floor to another. If you have a more narrow, taller building where kids are going up and down stairs, their close interaction is greater in the stairwells than they would be if they're just walking down long corridors. And you can channel the way kids move in a corridor. How you lay out your cafeteria. How many kids do you have? How many kids are going to go to the cafeteria? How do you space out the lunch period so that you keep it as social distance as you can? There are things that you can do, but it does depend on the physical logistics 
of the, of the uh, location. That's what every store has already gone through and trying to figure out where do I put a plexiglass? How do I protect these diners from the next diners? What do I do in terms of the HVAC system uh, in, in, a, in an older building versus a newer building? So I think, Samantha, the, the challenge, because it's district by district, rather than a central county decision. Right now, the decision is not a central county decision. That power does not belong to us. If the governor chose to do it, the governor could do it. But uh, it's a district by district decision. So in Bronxville, where you have a singular building and you can manage a singular building, you can do things there that you may not be able to do in the Yonkers School District that has 27,000 children and, and innumerable numbers of buildings. And so every community is a bit different. I understand that, uh, you know, parents, uh, and as I said, I think I said already, I understand why they want the kids back in for the quality of the learning, and there's a host of reasons why it makes sense. And many times the logistics of the parent's life, if you have two parents who are working, and now you have three kids at a home that are supposed to be learning remote that completely upsets the dynamic of the family from a work standpoint and from a, you know, a circumstance point. And then, of course, there are issues of mental health and, and, and uh, dealing with this, this difficult thing. We're all trying to deal with something that's very difficult. Younger kids have much more of a problem dealing with that, not just little kids, you know, teenagers in high school. I understand all of that. But open our schools today is not a singular decision that can be made by anybody, period, other than the governor. The governor could authorize all schools to be open. In terms of the school district that you're in, your superintendent and your school board could make the decision to open it up, but they will have to meet certain health criteria. The county gets in not to say you can't open your school district, but when you open your school district, this is what you'll have to do in order to be safe. And those provisions can be difficult and perhaps impossible in a particular situation. And, and the explanation is, is not what people necessarily want to hear, but it is the factual reality of things. If you have a school district with X number of buildings, you're going to open up the whole district. You're going to have to look at every single school building, how many kids in a classroom, how many teachers do you have, how are you going to take them through their lessons uh, in order to stay safe. And you have to work those things out before you open the doors. It's not just, you know what, this is not that bad. The kids are going to be fine. Put them back in the class. Not that simple. But I understand the frustration and the pressure. People have a right to assemble. If they're assembling today to rally, to speak truth to power, by all means, the power does not rest in the county executive to, to deliver that which you hope for. But we are certainly going to work with every school district that determines that they want to open partially or completely to try to help them provide whatever this level of service that they decide that they can do. Until and unless the governor decides with his superior executive authorities to mandate that all schools be open, in which case the schools will be open by, you know, the authority that the governor has. Are there any other questions, Catherine? Are we good? Very good. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, again, I apologize. I, I, you know, I uh, can be long-winded, but I try to be explanatory and try to give you metaphors that you can, you know, relate to in everyday terms for the things that we're talking about. And if, uh, you know, 65% of what I say doesn't move you or affect you, that's fine. Maybe some percentage of what I say has some value to you. Uh, we'll be back on Monday to give the next update. Hopefully the numbers will continue to drop. I, I look at these numbers every day, and I just hope that, you know, we have no fatalities overnight. I hope to see a drop in the, in the hospitalizations before we come on. And so we'll hope that uh, the tide will, will turn, and uh, we hope that we'll be able to effectively get out more of the vaccine and get through this. So thank you for watching. I'm George Latimer, Worcester County Executive. Take care. Stay safe. Have a good weekend. We'll see you Monday.